Hi and welcome to the webinar. This is Deanna James um, with Castlewood Treatment Center and today's webinar is going to feature uh, Dr. Mary Beth Weinstock and she's going to be speaking on dance movement therapy groups for clients with eating disorders, jumping the hurdle of fear into conscious embodiment. And this is part two. We did part one of this series about a year ago. Um, don't worry if you missed that one. Mary Beth's going to do a little bit of review. Um, but really just wanted to get into a little bit more um, meat and examples of interventions and examples of, of things that you can do both in your practice if you are a dance movement therapist as well as for those of you who are not. So we're very excited that you joined us today. And um, uh, just, uh, just a, a piece of, of housekeeping note, we uh, will provide CEUs for this event. You will get an email from GoToWebinar after the event and it will have a link to an online survey. You need to fill out that survey and then about a week after that we will um, we will be um, sending out a, a CEU certificate. So if you do not, for some reason, get that automated email from GoToWebinar, then you can please feel free to, to email me directly. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us today. And without further ado, here is Dr. Mary Beth Weinstock. Thank you so much, Deanna. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you're listening from. And I'm, I'm speaking to you from beautiful our beautiful facility, Monarch Cove in Pacific Grove, California. We're surrounded by the ocean, and it's a very beautiful facility. So welcome. Today, what we'll be talking about is, as Deanna said, a brief review of what we did last year. I actually want to spend more time on part two of the presentation. And uh, so I'll go into some basic principles of dance movement therapy and how it applies to eating disorders, and then spend most of our time fo and, and also focusing on definitions of the diagnoses we work with. And then we'll spend most of our time with more in-depth conversation about dance movement therapy techniques that have been effective in the recovery process. So I'm, I'm not going to be reading slides for you, but for today, I, I always love to start with the definition of dance movement therapy, the way it's defined by the American Dance Therapy Association. So um, you've probably looked at this slide, but you can read along with me. So based on the assumption that the body and mind are interrelated, body movement therapy is defined as the psychotherapeutic use of movement to further the emotional, cognitive, physical, and social integration of the individual. I love to underline that part because it's so important in the work that we do with our clients with eating disorders. The dance movement therapist focuses on movement behavior as it emerges in the therapeutic relationship. Expressive, communicative, and adaptive behaviors are all considered for both group and individual treatment. Body movement as the core component of dance simultaneously provides the means of assessment and the mode of intervention for dance movement therapy. And I included um, some a sampling of the slides from last year. So, so for those of you who weren't with me last year, you can familiarize yourself with the slides that I provided. But I will be moving forward through. So. The, the for, I included the uh, slide about Chafe's method because that's the form of dance movement therapy that I mostly use. And then in terms of, so there's a the slide that says commonalities of forms of dance movement therapy and I wanted to underline in this one that in our work as dance movement therapists we provide safe space to contain, re-experience, and work through bodily held blocks. So here at Monarch Cove, I mostly work with clients who have very acute issues um, of, with their eating disorders. Um, so most of our clients are very, very stuck in their process. And so then also in this slide, it talks about how through movement, the clients, um, so the, the clients are exposed to this method that is an expression of self. And I'm going to be talking a lot today about 
the concept of self and how dance movement therapy and the techniques that we use help our clients to access something that feels more like their authentic self rather than feeling like they're living completely through their eating disorder and their other maladaptive coping skills. And then I included the slides about assessment because we use our dance movement therapy techniques as a form of assessment. And then at here at Castlewood, our philosophy of treatment is that we encourage an exploration of the mind-body connection in order to assist those struggling with eating disorders to begin to forge a new relationship with their bodies, one that is compassionate, accepting, and kind. And then I wanted to add to the eating disorder diagnoses moving forward. Um, so I wanted to add that in addition, in, in addition to anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, eating disorder um, not otherwise specified, and binge eating disorder, that we've also added another category, which is orthorexia. Um, this isn't defined yet in the DSM, but orthorexia, <coughs> excuse me, is a form of eating disorders where our clients are very focused on body issues, on health issues, so that's health quote unquote italicized. We encounter this a lot here in California where folks are very, very, very health conscious, so they're over exercising, they're eating only certain categories of foods, they're um, many, uh, often they're vegan um, and refusing to eat many just vast categories of food. And the de rigueur philosophy for working with clients with eating disorders at this point is that there are no good and bad foods because our clients restrict so much so, and we're trying to normalize their idea of what healthy movement is and what healthy exercise is. So this is a challenge for folks, for the dance movement therapists, for the folks who are working in embodied groups, working with bodily issues. We're very challenged these days with what the diet industry and the exercise industry are pushing as health. For our folks, they take it in, in a very OCD manner. Um, so this brings in the coexisting conditions. Um, so we're working with our clients who have, most of our clients have very exacerbated anxiety disorders, including in their OCD, they often have um, exercise addiction. So that's one of our challenges it's in working with movement is figuring out a way to help our clients move in a way that's embodied so that they're not completely isolated from their bodies, but then at the other extreme, they're not over-moving, over-exercising. So in terms of eating disorders and dance movement therapy, we're working with our clients <coughs> to explore their relationship to their body, and they have a tendency to detach from their feelings. And what we tend to see is that our clients are extremely sensitive to the sensations of their bodies, but not to their feelings. So I'll be talking more about alexithymia later on, but they, they have a very difficult time expressing what their feelings are, but they're very tuned into how their bodies feel. So instead of having feelings, they're tuned into how help the sensations of their body. So feelings get encapsulated into bodily sensations instead of emotions. So we work a great deal with that as well. How to, how to use the body to feel feelings. And then healing cannot fully take place unless they're able to challenge themselves to live in their bodies. So this is a central component of their body image. And dance movement therapy provides a structure for them to be able to do that. And I'm going to say, just go ahead and read along with you the slide with the definition of body image. It's a subjective experience of one's own physical appearance established both by self-observation and by noting reactions of others. And I am going to be talking about body image a lot today. So it's not 
this exactly the same as doing a dance movement therapy group and working with movement, but it's an essential component of being able to do that work with our clients. And I, I've been finding that I've been developing that since I've been working at um, here at Monarch Cove that um, there's a great emphasis on working with body image and I it I doing this I've been doing this work for 40 years and there just there's a, a pretty much of a paucity of resources in terms of being able to work directly with body image with our clients who are so acutely challenged and so I've been putting together lot of different resources and I'm going to share them with you today because I've been finding them very helpful in working with my colleagues here, finding different kinds of resources and having to be very creative about working with this incredibly difficult challenge our clients have. And so we have to tell our clients that body image is really the last thing to go in terms of their recovery. It, they might start, if they stay really focused on, re on their recovery, they're going to start to feel some relief probably a year in. It's so difficult to feel relief from the challenges they feel. So the imagined um, defects in their appearance. So here in this, uh, this slide with a definition about body dysmorphic disorder. So our, client, our clients are very preoccupied with their appearance, but then in body dysmorphic disorder, there are specific body parts that they're looking at and <clears throat> their concern is excessive. So they might, so especially with the women, they're looking at mostly at um, secondary sexual characteristics, they're looking at hip, they're looking at um, all of the body parts that, <clears throat> excuse me, the media blasts tell us are that we're not supposed to have in order to be somehow physically appealing. Um, and I'm going to be about the, that more later as well. This is very difficult for our clients who have a predisposition, mostly, mostly have genetic predisposition to having these issues and then they get blasted with these images that are completely impossible to achieve. And we don't want them to be doing that anyway. We want them to be able to become more comfortable with their natural bodies, their natural form. So then um, alexithymia, I, I, I highly recommend reading Zerv. Um, her art, her um, writings about alexithymia are wonderful. <coughs> Excuse me. So yeah. alexithymia, many, many of our clients have alexithymia and it's defined as a difficulty in putting feelings and fantasies into words. And um, I would say 95%, I don't, that's not an exact statistic, so please don't quote me on it, but in terms of the people I, would, I work with, I would say 95% of them have alexithymia. So they have a, an enormous difficulty just being able to say, this is how I'm feeling right now. And we give a lot of our clients feelings charts so they can start to name their feelings. So, and dance movement therapy is a wonderful way to work with this. So, one of the ways dance movement therapy helps is through the development of mindfulness of bodily sensations, leading to a more realistic sense of body boundaries and self. So, instead of just having a sense of self in the head where they tend to be locked in, we're trying to help them re-embody so that their sense of self is bodily felt. And we do a lot of this through psychoeducation. And so then, okay, so moving forward, then addressing these issues, we'll be talking about body image group, movement group, mindfulness, meditation, relaxation group. And I'm not going to be talking as much about creative arts and expressive therapies groups today, but we, we do a lot of those here at um, Castlewood. Um, in fact, our wonderful hostess, Deanna James, is also a dance movement therapist. I believe I'm ther dance therapist number five who was hired here. Um, and there's a, just a lovely emphasis on working with creative arts therapies to help our clients heal. So then, uh, so body image group, um, I provided some resources. Uh, I wanted you to be able to have um, access to many of the resources that have been helping me. 
Um, so the Body Positive, I'll be talking more about them. They've, they've just published a book, Embody, Learning to Love Your Unique Body and Quiet the Critical Voice. The Don't Diet, Live at Workbook by Andrea Wachter and Marcy Marcus. The Food and Feelings Workbook by Karen Koenig. I'll be talking about IFS, so Introduction to the Internal Family Systems Model by uh, Dick Schwartz. And then I also, I'm, I'm not going to be talking about this as much, but I included the GERS website in case you're not acquainted with this. The um, GERS website, the NEDA website, the NEDA, National Eating Disorders Association, they have wonderful handouts that you can download um, to give out to clients for body image groups, um, working with clients with eating disorders. They can be very helpful, just giving them very basic definitions of what's going on for them and working with them through that. It's, it's, there are also wonderful handouts to give to families and loved ones. So I wanted to point that out to you. I love the GERS website. And the GERS catalog is a wonderful resource to give out to families. It's filled with um, all kinds of books and resources. I, I highly recommend ordering them for your clients. They're free as well. OK, so we'll start with internal family systems in terms of our uh, talking about body image groups. Uh, if you're not familiar, <coughs> excuse me, with internal family systems work, Dick Schwartz came to this model through his work with just the, the basic family systems model where uh, families take on roles as we're as working therapists, we're very familiar with that, with the roles that family members take on, especially when they have an identified patient or um, a loved one with an addiction, with an eating disorder. And what he found was that in his work with clients with dissociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality disorder, that they had what that was going on inside of them was that there's this full-on system very much like the external family systems, that they had this system internally that was where, where the different parts of themselves took on different roles to just help them fu function. So he started working with them that way, and then he found that everybody had that. He found that all his clients had this internal system happening, not in the fractured way that folks with the, the, this dissociative identity disorder have, but, but that we all have parts of ourselves. He started exploring his own parts of himself. So for instance, with our clients, the eating disorder is a huge part of themselves, and it feels like it takes over their entire identity. So many of our clients feel like they've lost their sense of self. We hear that constantly, and that, this, that the eating disorder has completely taken over, and they can't access self. And this is my favorite part of working with internal family systems work is that um, Dick came up with this wonderful method of finding self. So, within, so if you'll move forward in the eight C's of self, the slide that says IFS and body image, the eight C's of self, he came up with these eight qualities. So calmness, clarity, curiosity, compassion, confidence, courage, creativity, and connectedness. I do group after group using these, this concept. So I will put it up on the board, have them write it down, have them take it in through every sense possible. So this is how we start to embody this concept of self. Take it in through your ears, take it in through your eyes, take it in through your kinesthetic sense, take it in every way possible. And so the way I start to have them embody it is by having them just if they want to close their eyes, they can. For some of our clients who are very traumatized, it's very difficult for them to close their eyes, but they can still do an internal kind of a focus and have them start to just feel in their body where they feel the qualities. So I'll go through them one by one. We can do this together now. So calmness. So for you, just in your seat today doing this, you can just kind of do a body scan. And notice if calmness feels accessible to you, or is it something that's hard for you? So I work with just normalizing that, that there might be qualities of self that are very difficult for them to access. There might be ones that feel very familiar. So I'm normalizing that immediately, making it OK to either be able to feel this or not feel this, and then asking them to notice where in their body they notice calmness. If they were able to feel it, where would it be? 
if they have felt it in the past, where did they feel it in their body? And it could be that it's not so much a bodily sensation, it could be more that they feel it emotionally or they feel it in their, or they can access it through their mind and all of that is fine. It's that we're, we're focusing inward, and we're becoming embodied with it. Then I do the same thing with clarity. You can do that for yourself. Where do you experience clarity in your being? And then curiosity. Go ahead and do a body scan. Notice where you feel curiosity. And then compassion. This one's a top favorite with our clients. They often feel reams of compassion for others, but have a very hard time bringing it in towards themselves. And then confidence. This one's especially amenable to feeling it in one's body. Clients often report feeling it somehow in their spine, in their posture, in their shoulders. So for yourself, you can notice where you feel confidence when you do feel it. <coughs> Courage as well is very amenable to bodily felt sensations and often is felt in the same place as confidence is felt. Then creativity. Go ahead and do a body scan and notice for yourself if you have access to it and where you have access to it in your body. And then connectedness. This can be connection to self, connection to other, connection to your internal workings. So then what I do with the clients after we've run through this is I might have them pick one and pick one that really stands out for them that they could really feel that day and have them start to just embody that. We did this in a group yesterday where I asked them to, they, everybody was sitting on the floor to start to change level. To, so feel it in your spot on the floor in your seated posture and then take it into the next level. So bringing themselves up and up and up till they're finally standing, doing it really slowly so then they can feel it in their standing posture and then starting to take a step forward, starting to feel it in their hands, starting to feel it just gently exploring the space around them and then walking around with it, just really simply walking in that quality. So what is it like to walk in calmness? What's it like to walk in compassion? What's it like to walk in creativity? And then they can start to interact with one another in various ways, if you feel confident to do that, to give instructions that way. So they can start to, they, so what we did yesterday was that they stopped and they just briefly interviewed one another. They asked each other which quality they were and then where they felt it in their body, what it was like for them. There was a lot of excitement and giggling that went on. It, it became very animated. And then had them walk around again and do kind of a stop once again and interview each other. So not only are they experiencing how they feel it in their bodies, but they're allowing themselves to really stand in that connection with self. And I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is in terms of body image to be able to stand in self. I know that on a personal note, in terms of recovery that I went through many, many, many years ago, that the more connection I felt with self, the more confident I felt in my body, the, the less I was focused on my appearance, what I look like, and the more I was focused on just appreciating myself, my inner qualities, who I am as a human being, and then that infused me with a sense of confidence about who I am exactly the way I am. 
and I love to uh, I love sharing that with them. For different therapists, have different feelings about self disclosure, but you can use me as an example if you like. If you don't want to do self disclosure, if you don't want to talk about your own relationship with self, um, but I have found that that the more sense of self, the less focused I am with what I look like and with images of impossible images that I'm bombarded with. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they they actually they perk up when they hear that. They love hearing that there is a possible that people have experienced that that they have moved through it that they have moved forward and that they are able to embody who they are at this moment without being so focused on numbers and what they look like and what do other people think they look like and what do other people look like. Just focusing on self and this sense of confidence or calmness or compassion can help to switch gears so with with greater greater ease as recovery moves forward. So and I wanted to give you some more creative resources for body image groups. So these these particular resources I find really helpful when clients are in an extremely stuck place and when there's a in the milieu when many of the clients are feeling stuck together and it might be in a certain kind of stuckness it might be that that all of them have their critical voice very loud or they're all talking about shame or many of them are talking about perfectionism or being very close down to their feelings so I wanted to provide some resources that I have found really helpful so the don't diet live it workbook and the citation is in a few slides back um, the in particular I love the ch chapters on criticism versus praise and the chapter on shame and I just go ahead and copy those articles and we'll just share going around the room, each person reading a paragraph and then talking about that, well before talking about it, just doing a little bit of writing first about how, how it affected them and then talking about what stood out for them. And then if we can move into embodiment, we do. It might be that we need to sit with that for a little bit before we can move forward into embodiment because if the critical voice is very, very loud, the shame voice is very, very loud, the perfectionism voice is very loud, it might be hard, very, very difficult for them to become embodied in that moment. But we're building, this is, it's a building block to getting to that place. So acknowledging that the critical voice makes it really hard for them to just be in their body. The shame voice makes it really hard for them to be in their body. So normalizing that, sharing that with one another, uh, it can be very reassuring for them that they're not the only one, <clears throat> so excuse me, they're not the freak in the room who's you know just feeling this horrible, nobody else is feeling this horrible, they're all kind of in there together. Um, and so all of these, uh, then the, uh, so then the GERS website um, has this article about the many faces of perfectionism, which I also find really helpful. And then in the functions of, the function of feelings, uh, in the food, excuse me, in the food and feelings workbook, the very first chapter, the function of feelings, I find also to lay a really great groundwork for this work as well. Um, I love the title, you mean there's a point to all this misery, and it goes through just step by step why they have all of the feelings that they have, what, what's the bodily purpose, what's the purpose in their lives. So we have to have anger. Um, if you see a little old lady walking across the street and someone knocks the little old lady over, you're not going to want to just stand there, you're going to want to help her and your anger might help you get there. So just using really basic examples of why we have our feelings, why we need to be in our bodies, why it's so important for us to be embodied because we have to have our feelings in order to exist, in order to move through the world, in order to function. So emphasizing that over and over again, laying the groundwork, laying the foundation to be able to become embodied since they're so fearful of being embodied. And then I included Maria Gambutas um, Lucky me, I got. I went to a graduate school where the sacred feminine was included, um, and I will. I'll, I'm going to talk about her more in a couple of slides. But I just I wanted to give you a heads up about who Maria Gambutas is. So then I also 
bring in uh, when they're stuck, when they're in that space. Uh, juicy quotes. This is one that I love particular, particularly from the Don't Diet, Live It workbook. Remind yourself. So I will have each person actually go around the room and read this quote out loud. Remind yourself that true beauty is not simply skin deep. When you feel good about yourself and who you are, you carry yourself with a sense of confidence. So there's one of those C's of self-confidence, self-acceptance, and openness that makes you beautiful, regardless of whether you physically look like a supermodel. Beauty is a state of mind, not a state of your body. And I go very deeply into talking about beauty and what beauty is, and I'll be talking about that more when we discuss body positive work. Um, so I asked them actually to underline what stands out for them in this quote, um, to reword it for themselves, to make up their own quote about what true beauty is, any of their reactions that they're having to this particular quote. A lot of them talk about the supermodel being involved in that, and that you know, they don't like it, it pisses them off, and I'm like, good, yeah, get politicized, get radical about this, that's great, and then they can feel that in their bodies, they can feel, you know, I'm having a, you know, a bodily sensation about those words and about the particular words that are in here. I really encourage them to fully feel that, go ahead and make your own definition of beauty, what do you think beauty is? And then one other thing I really like to do with this in terms of the embodiment, so if they can't feel it in themselves, go ahead and think of someone in your life whom you think embodies this. It could be someone you actually know, it could be a friend, it could be a mentor, it could be a teacher, it could be someone who's passed on, it could be you know, a loved one, it could be someone in the family whom they've heard about over and over again, it could, it could be a famous person. I love when they pick celebrities who aren't getting plastic surgery, who are allowing themselves to age, who allow themselves to have their natural bodies. Um, it, it's great when they can name that person as exuding these qualities of beauty that are not appearance related in terms of this very narrow definition that we've been bombarded with about what beauty is. So can they develop new role models? Which brings us to body positive, which I'm so excited to be sharing with you about today. Um, I went to the training with the two other of my colleagues here at Monarch Cove, and I can't recommend it more highly. <laughs> it, it, it was, it changed, it, it changed me. So part of the training in, in Body Positive is that you actually experience what you're going to be doing in the work with the folks you're going, you're going to be working with. So you have to embody the Body Positive philosophy. You have to at least be in process with embodying the Body Positive philosophy. So I want to clarify, I always tell my clients this, that Body Positive um, that when they hear it, they almost roll their eyes and groan when they hear just the term body positive. <laughs> Sometimes they do. Um, but what I emphasize to them is what body positive means. It does not mean um, like a new agey kind of concept of, oh, yay, we're going to love our bodies, because that takes a really long time to do. What it refers to is that in our culture, there's so we, we're, we have so many messages that are negative about bodies, that you're not good enough the way you are. You have to do all these things to yourself to be worthy, to, be, um, to, to have appeal to other human beings, to, to be just worthy of existing in this world, of having a place in this world, of getting good jobs. You have to look a certain way. And it's, I mean, we all know it's getting worse and worse and worse. So, so body positive refers to having a positive relationship with the body instead of a negative relationship with the body. So we're, we're relating to our own body the way it is, who we are, with all of our DNA, with everything that we've been given in our lives in a positive way instead of in a negative way. So I want to read, this is such a juicy quote, so Connie Sobchak and Elizabeth Scott created Body Positive, and Connie Sobchak just published this book, Embody, which I highly recommend. It's filled with just wonderful philosophy and, and all kinds of work that's really helpful to do with our clients. Some of it you have to titrate. Elizabeth and Connie mostly work with people who, have, who are not 
um, at the level of the clients I work with at acute level, um, even at the partial hospitalization or intensive outpatient level of treatment, they're more working with people who have already done that work and are moving forward. So then, imagine living in a world where people possess gen genuine self-love and are free to experience their own authentic beauty. A world where a compassionate, forgiving voice is consistently brought forth to counteract self-criticism, where having an appetite for life is both honored and valued. It is a state of mind and a growing cultural movement that offers people the opportunity to put down the burdens of judgment, comparison, and shame in order to cultivate a relationship with themselves that is built on a foundation of self-love and trust. And what I love so much about Body Positive is that I actually think of it as like as a radical social movement. And I, I think Connie and Elizabeth would put it at least kind of that way. So I often when people don't understand that when I when I offer that to them. I liken it to the queer movement which came about in the 90s. It was a very radical left-wing movement that, so for folks who were trying to get their rights and be acknowledged in terms of their sexual orientation, if it wasn't heterosexual, the queer movement took it to this very radical extreme. And what that did was that it, it normalized a gay gay rights, it normalized um, lesbian rights, it normalized, um, it, it gave people a, a different perspective on being able to challenge their relationship with otherness. And so, and I think of body positive as being a social movement much in that way that we're challenging these distorted definitions of beauty. So, that's one of the things that, that we start with with body positive. I'm not going to be able to go through really specific training methods with you because you have to be trained in body positive, but I'm going to talk to you about just give just whet your appetite <laughs> to take the training. So so we talk a lot about messages in body positive. What just asking clients where they get all the messages from in their lives and they can, you know, the, the lists are huge. So we're bombarded in many different ways. Some of them can be more subtle than others. So obviously media, but then there are also family and cultural messages that might be implicit, that might not be as explicit as we would think that people accept cultural, familial, peer standards that they might not be thinking about so readily without talking about it out loud. So they get to challenge that, and then in challenging that, they get to reclaim their definition of what beauty is. They get to name for themselves what is beauty. It's not this extremely narrow definition that we're having foisted on us, mostly by a lot of very greedy people who want us to buy a whole bunch of things. Um, it's also very oppressive. Um, it, there are definitely implications for power and politics in here, um, which can also politicize and mobilize our clients. That's, that's one way in. Um, but it's mostly just to reclaim their own definition of beauty because beauty is wonderful. It's wonderful to have beauty in our lives. It's nourishment. It's, it's art. It, it feeds us. Um, so how do we take back that definition of beauty for ourselves? And then it very much, the body positive philosophy very much encourages them to listen to their body. So we do it in really simple ways, like just pick one thing that your body does for you that you appreciate. And I, I'm always amazed at what they come up with, the, my clients, because they're so, they're in such hate mode, they're in such an oppositional mode with their bodies that for, they often will come up with very surprising, like they might say their feet help them to walk, their hands help them to create things, their throat helps them to speak, their lungs help them to breathe. So just being able to name one thing that they don't feel in opposition to helps to breathe life back into their relationship with their body. And then one of my favorite parts of, of the body positive work is just appreciating ethnicity uh, because once again we have this really narrow definition that uh, many people do not fit into, most people don't fit into because it just doesn't ethnically fit. Um, and how to re-appreciate 
our DNA and where we come from, just being able to pick one relative, even if they have come from very traumatic backgrounds, they might be able to name one relative that they actually had some kind of positive relationship and one quality that they have from that relative, that's one seed into appreciating their ethnicity and their own body and the way they walk around in the world, the way they are embodied in this world. We do a lot with confronting negative self-talk, so there's a lot of instruction on how to work with critical voice. And then as they get to get to higher stages of healing, then they can start to work on self-care. Of course, we do that here in treatment, but then them being able to use intuitive self-care is going to come at later stages of their recovery. And then building community. So we, we're starting to do that here in residential treatment with and in outpatient treatment in terms of group work, but then in body positive, they actually have body positive clubs in high schools and in colleges. So they so there, there are body positive dorms in colleges so that instead of being in the in the dorm that's filled with folks with eating disorders or folks who are competing in terms of what they look like, they get to be in a body positive community so they can talk to one another about the pressures. Then uh, Maria Gambutas, I'm going to talk about this quickly because I want to definitely have time to talk to you about um, movement ritual. Um, so Maria Gambutas, Gambutas was an archaeologist who reclaimed archaeology um, and reframed it in terms of instead of male definitions of archaeology and of the sacred feminine images, um, she unearthed amazing sites where uh, the sacred feminine was the that was the organizing structure of the societies that she looked at. So she unearthed many um, forms of of goddess worship, and her books are just filled with images that are wonderful for our clients to look at. Um, so they get to reframe, like so, you know. And, and really reevaluate what is this time that we're in right now. So the books that I listed um, under ancient imagery have lots of, of images for them to look at and explore and talk about together. So then in terms of mindfulness, meditation, and relaxation, I do a lot of this work with our clients. Um, so what I want to emphasize, because I'm running out of time and I want to make sure I talk to you about movement ritual, um, is that and when you're when you're doing relaxation, when you're doing mindfulness, when you're doing meditation, to make sure it's very embodied to start with. So I I don't have them sit in upright meditation posture. I actually make it one of the practices of meditation group and relaxation group for them to take out thick yoga pads, to take out pillows, to take out blankets to do whatever they need to do to make their body comfortable and I give them a lot of time to do that. I also offer to them that I'm going to have my eyes open during the meditation and they can raise their hand if they need extra pillows, if they even need to adjust their position in a really slight way to make their body um, comfortable. They need tons of permission to do this because they don't feel like they deserve this. They don't deserve to be comfortable, they don't deserve to to even be in their body. So tons and tons and tons of permission around this and they do it throughout the meditation normalizing that it's okay to be doing this. Um, definitely bring in time for them to allow their thoughts to release, to get in touch with their breath. For many of our clients doing breath work is very difficult so I use the word natural a lot just to be with their natural breath. Don't have to change it, don't have to do anything with it, stay with breath. And then I gave some instructions for you in terms of progressive relaxation. I don't have them move. I don't have them tense or release their muscles the way I used to do it a long time ago. I, I really just talk them through it so they don't have to do anything, um, constantly using calm voice. So then moving forward um, into movement ritual. You did not receive the slides on movement ritual. I think they will be added and available to you um, with Deanna. Um, 
after the webinar, um, but I wanted to read to you just a couple of quotes from Anna, Anna Halperin, who created Movement Ritual. Um, she's been my dance teacher for many years. She's an iconoclast in the world of dance. She's 93 years old. Actually, no, she just had her 94th birthday. She's 94 and still moving, still beautiful to watch dancing. Um, she's very much into natural movement with working with people who are trained dancers but also working with just anyone and drawing movement out of them. So I use a lot of her philosophy in working with the clients I work with. Movement ritual is a very basic, quiet form of warm-up and I'm going to read to you how she developed it. Movement ritual has served me well in a number of ways. As a form of meditation, as a way to build up a strong and flexible body, as a catalyst to get in touch with myself emotionally as well as physically, as a time set aside to let go, as a means to measure development within my body range, as a way to claim my body as me as opposed to impose stylized dance and other techniques, as a form of self-healing of impaired or injured body areas, as a gift to myself of time and space to do something for myself. So I'm sure you can glean from that how helpful that is for our clients who are in such opposition to their bodies and their and health. So just really basically what we start with is rubbing hands together really, 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 really quickly, um, getting heat in, in between our hands, and then placing placing your hand, you can do this for yourself now, just rub your hands together really quickly till you feel heat in between them. And then cup your hands over your eyes and allow yourself to enjoy the warmth of your own hands. And just feeling your eyes bathing in that, feeling your eyes relaxing back into the eye sockets. And so as you're doing that, you can imagine for clients who have such an oppositional relationship with their body, that they're using their own body, their own hands to soothe themselves. So using their own body as a self-soothing technique. Our clients are, don't have self-soothing techniques. They come here with their eating disorder as their self-soothing technique. So we have to give them, we have to provide other means of being able to self-soothe. I, most of my clients enjoy doing this. So they don't, if they don't like putting their hands on their face, they can rub their hands together again and place it anywhere on their body that they feel needs healing and they can use it in conjunction with breath. If they're having digestive issues and they're okay with putting their hands on their belly, they can put it there. So this can be done sitting up. I mostly like doing it lying down. And then it can continue, that doing that can continue into self-massage. Um, any way that they want to do that. They can just place their hands on their arms or on their feet, on their fingers if they have aversion to touching themselves. It could just be massaging their fingers. It can go to rib cage, it can go to belly. So then the natural movements that Anna uses are, so once we've done that just basic warm up and feeling the breath, just, just not, not basic warm-up, but basic just getting in touch with the body. They can also do really simple movements like rotating their shoulders and noticing what they feel like, what that feels like. So if I rotate my shoulder, what happens to my elbow? What happens to my hand? What happens to my fingers? So I'm using that quality of curiosity to help them start to reconnect into their body and just notice simple movement. So if I rotate my hips inward, what happens to my legs? What happens to my feet? noticing that. And then again, the changing level, they can go from doing really simple warm-ups on the floor, stretching, really easy movements. I, I can't really describe them to you in the in our webinar, but I would highly recommend that you study movement ritual. Um, they're very yoga-like movements and it goes from lying down to then changing level to seated to kneeling, to standing, and even just doing that with clients, having them be very conscious of what they need to do in the most natural, slow, conscious way, getting from lying down to sitting up and then to standing. You can spend a whole group doing that, just feeling what body parts have to move. What is it like to do it slowly? What's it like to do quickly? And you can do the, use those same concepts with just walking around the room, feeling their feet on the floor going slow, going fast, stopping, going, um, freezing, um, 
And so I highly recommend doing this. Um, it can lead into more creative movement, like actually going very, very slow, going very, very fast, mirroring it with a, a partner. Um, and again, I highly recommend <laughs> doing this with um, studying it, actually studying it with Anna uh, at her Tomapa Institute in Marin. She gives lots of weekend and week-long courses, so you don't have to be an ongoing student there. And then we always do some kind of a cool-down, some kind of a cognitive acknowledgement of what we just did. So then I included the goals of dance movement therapy slide from last year, and you can read through that for yourself. And I'm going to end with our wonderful host, Deanna James, a quote that um, I read last year to end with, ask regularly about what clients are experiencing in their body during therapy. This integrates the mind and body and dismantles the familiar talking head syndrome in which clients are cognitively and intellectually insightful but disembodied. The eating disorder lives in the body. The only way out is through the body. And with that, I'll end and we can go into question period, question and answer period. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. That was absolutely wonderful. So for those of you that have questions, we would love to hear from you. And the way that we will do that is on your GoToWebinar um, little pull-out box that says GoToWebinar on it, not on your internet screen, but on your actual box that is from GoToWebinar, there's a questions feature. And you can actually just type a question in there. And we will see that, and I will read it aloud. We have all attendees on, on mute, because otherwise everyone would try to talk all at the same time to ask questions. <laughs> so instead, we just ask that you type your question, and we will get those questions answered for you and, and have Mary Beth um, address them. And um, as you're doing that, as people are typing questions that they might have, um, one of the things that I want to make sure um, that, because we had several people join us after I made this announcement, is that you will get an automated email from GoToWebinar, and that will give you a link to an online survey. And you need to fill out that survey, and then about a week after that, we will send out CEU certificates to everyone. Um, who attended. But you do have to fill out that survey in order for us to, to send you an, um, a, value, um, an, a CEU certificate. And then also we do record these. So this will be recorded and it will be up on our web our websites, both Castlewood's website and Monarch Cove website. And they will be under the webinars feature. All of our uh, previous webinars are up and, and loaded on there. You can watch them on YouTube anytime. We cannot provide CEUs after the fact, but you're welcome to watch them or share them with colleagues anytime. And so I do have a question here, Mary Beth. Um, can you expand upon the difference between connectedness and compassion in regards to the eight C's of self-leadership? Oh, that's beautiful. Um, often when clients ask questions like that, I ask them to go inside and ask themselves that question. So how did they experience it in their body? I am going to answer it, but I, I just want to be emphatic that this is my personal experience of that quality of self. So. So in terms of compassion, compassion is that sense of empathy, of caring, um, that's not sympathy, that's not pity, it's just being able to listen and hear. And for our clients, they're very much able to do that for others, but not for themselves. So it's being able to give themselves, to, to listen to the the achy parts of themselves, the young parts of themselves, the vulnerable parts of themselves, to listen to that with love and empathy. Um, so that's compassion. Connectedness, actually, they're very related because you have to have connectedness in order to be able to do this. But connectedness can take many different forms for our clients. They can feel they're so isolative that even if they're feeling compassion for other people, it, it's very difficult for them to reach out. Um, many of them have social anxiety. Um, they feel disconnected internally. They feel disconnected externally. It's very difficult for them to feel like they actually can relate to other human beings at times. If they feel like a freak, they feel like nobody would want to talk to me. No 
nobody would want to be with me. So it makes it very difficult for them to feel connected to their outside world. And it can also make it very difficult for them to be connected to their internal world. They're frightened of their internal world, if they, especially if they've been through trauma. Um, but even just having the body image issues, it's very difficult for them to feel like they can access the, what they need to be able to access in order to function and to be able to connect to those qualities, the eight C's that we talked about, to be able to just feel my sense of confidence, feel my sense of courage. How do I connect in with that if I'm disembodied? Great. Thank you so much. Um, one of the questions was, would it be possible to um, get all everything that's on the screen? Yes, I sent out the PowerPoint ahead of time to everyone's email who was registered ahead of time. But some people's spam filters are really high for attachments and other things like that. So I will send out the um, attachments again. Um, and um, so you can have all of the handouts that are, are on the screen. So yes, definitely we will be sending those to you. And then um, uh, I had a, another kind of housekeeping question of how many CEs for this presentation. All of our webinars uh, for that are that are sponsored by Castlewood are one um, one continuing education unit because it's a one hour webinar. So we will uh, be sending out certificates for one C CE. And then um, we do have a few more questions here. Okay. And um, do you have? ideas about additional opportunities to discuss and develop movement therapy practice and work with eating disorders. Do I have further ideas for how to do that? Yeah, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, I, like, was yeah. this about school or workshops or, I mean, I would, I would highly suggest going to the American Dance Therapy Association website. I'm not sure if, that, what the, if that's what the question means, if it means about education and workshops and getting further work in terms of that. Is that what the person's asking? Uh, yeah, I think they're just asking for additional learning opportunities. Um, okay, so, so I... definitely go to the American Dance Therapy Association website. Um, and there are lots of dance movement therapists who work with eating disorders. It's, it's actually, a, I would say, a very advanced specialty for dance movement therapists, and it especially works with dance movement therapy because coming from the dance movement therapy world, uh, coming from the dance world, so many of us were encouraged to have eating disorders. We were in the trenches, and we totally understand it. So many dance movement therapists actually have a specialty in eating disorders, or if they don't, they really understand it. So there, there are definitely um, articles about it, um, thoughts that can be read about it. Um, and if I'm not answering you correctly, please feel free to email me, and I'll be happy to provide you with more learning opportunities in, in terms of dance movement therapy and eating disorders. I'm not sure if I answered that in the way that Per meant for it to be answered. And there are, I mean, there are master's programs in dance movement therapy, um, but perhaps you're thinking of something else. I'll no, I think that's great. Okay. Um, okay. If a client is disembodied, then how can you use this therapy to help a client not feel full and disgusting after eating? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I would say that's one of the things that takes a really long time. Um, I highly recommend the self-soothing techniques. Um, I'm wondering if, a, if a, a, an eating disorder client is actually asking that question um, because it's, it's one of the hardest things to do, and especially having movement group or body image group right after a meal can be so challenging and so difficult and clients can just refuse to come, but it's actually a perfect opportunity to work with the discomfort. So for I, I, what I have found to be one of the most useful techniques it was one that is the last one that I was just talking about, the movement ritual where you rub your hands together really quickly and then just gently place them anywhere on the body. They can be placed on the, on the belly. Um, you can also just use a heating pad instead of your hands and allowing yourself to receive the self-soothing. And 
it's going to take, for clients who hate their bodies and are feeling full and feeling disgusting, it's, going to, it's like an exposure therapy. It's like the way anxiety therapists work with exposures. You're going to have to go through the really difficult, uncomfortable time, take that leap of faith that what we're doing isn't meant to torture, it's not meant to hurt, it's meant to help and to allow yourself to eventually start to feel the self-soothing, um, feeling your emotional being, your psychic being, accepting that self-soothing. It's been happening through the eating disorder and there's that, you know, just very uncomfortable period where if you're in recovery and you're having to eat, um, where you're going to have to have this leap of faith that the folks who are working with you are, are actually have really good intentions and aren't trying to make you more uncomfortable. And there is going to be a period where the discomfort is going to spike but just to have that faith that the that using these self-soothing techniques, being able to embody them, being able to practice them is going to help you in the long run to, to lessen that sense of feeling disgusting and feeling so much um, body hatred. To be able to just work with yourself in a loving way, practicing it help, actually does help to reprogram your brain. So I couldn't say that 20 years ago, but now that we have all the brain studies, I can absolutely tell you that, your, that the circuits in your brain are going to switch. And it, it, it's by doing it bodily. It's also by using the words, but doing the bodily work is one of the quickest ways to re reprogram the brain, get those circuits changing around. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question here about... Um, person who feel you know this is this is great work and a great work that they could use also with their trauma survivors and those with dissociative disorders and um, wondering how do you recommend using body movement and dance in individual therapy versus group oh god I love work doing it individually um, sometimes I work adjunctively with clients here but I and I also have a private practice where I work with people individually through dance movement therapy and that actually I found that it took me several years of working with clients individually before I started feeling really comfortable with it. You have to have a lot of tricks up your sleeve and really individualize it for the clients that you're working with. But if you're asking particularly in terms of trauma, I start out very slowly with trauma survivors. Um, but so the techniques in the, in the slides in terms of mindfulness and, and doing um, progressive relaxation, I usually start with very low key, just being able to, to experience being taken care of, um, especially if the trauma is sexual trauma, some kind of physical trauma, being in the body is going to be very frightening for them. So creating safe space, creating a safe container in the room, checking in a lot. Um, so, so folks who, who have survived trauma often don't have very good boundaries about their bodies and they'll just do what you're asking them to do because they're being compliant because they feel that you know, this is, they have to do this in some way, but giving them a lot of permission to say, this doesn't feel good to me, I can't do that. And being able to acknowledge that and tweak whatever you're doing with your client to enable, to ensure, to provide as much comfort as possible. Um, as much safety as possible. Um, it could be that there's just very little that happens at first and being okay with very small increments and, and just having that constant, um, actually the, in one of the eight C's, having that constant, you're, you're going to have to have a constant compassion factor going on. You're going to have to feel a constant connection with the client and checking in and asking them to have that for themselves. Um, and then eventually you can work with mirroring, um, having them pick a movement that feels good to them. It could be just a simple stretch. It could be just yawning. It, it could be breathing together and mirroring that. Um, it could be that the mirroring makes them really nervous and they don't like mirroring. So you can check in about that and just be a witness. Um, it could also be that they need you to not look at them and to be able to accommodate that. So it's, 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 really, it's really listening in and really honoring what feels good in the moment to them? What can they tolerate? It might be that for a while you're just working with them curled up in a ball holding themselves, that they can't even emerge from that, and then just working really slowly with how do you emerge from being curled up in a ball to just you know feeling your hands, feeling your feet, 
what's safe in this moment. So those are some basic techniques of how I, how I would start with someone. Um, and then if you, if you get to continue doing the work, you can end up doing very, very creative um, movement and working in ways that are very exciting. Um, music can help with that a lot. Having them choose music that they really love um, can help um, activate the creative part of themselves so they can reconnect in and use their body in a more creative way. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. That's all the questions that we're going to have time for, so we're going to have to stop. Um, but thank you so much to everyone who participated and who um, shared their questions and their thoughts and feedback with us. And again, we, we look forward to having you continue to join us for our monthly webinars with Castlewood Treatment Centers. And um, if you need anything or have any questions for follow-up, please feel free to, to email us. And um, my email is the email that uh, it will come to for anything that you email go to webinar about. And so we will get that. And if there are questions for Mary Beth, I'll pass that on to her. So thank you very much, Mary Beth. And uh, we look forward to, to having future webinars. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.